Welcome to part 9 of Jesus the Christ. We begin part 9 with the hypostatic union. In the most basic terms, the concept of hypostatic union states that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. He simultaneously perfectly divine and perfectly human, having two complete and distinct natures at once. There are several references to Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. He knew and talked with guys like uh, Moses, Abraham, Job, and others. But he was not a human being at that time, although he did, on more than one occasion, appear in human form. The hypostatic union has to do with the incarnation of Christ into the earth as a human being. So we're dealing with, in that wise, New Testament. His hypostatic union with divine and human natures can be seen in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without him, there was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Uh, this, John the Baptist. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. <laughs> He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lights the uh, path of every man that comes into the world. That's your conscience. He's the one that lights up the conscience of every human being that comes into this earth. That was the true light. Someone said, well, how do I find Jesus if he, because uh, he's, you know, He's not Muslim, he's not Hindu, he's not Buddhist. How do you find him? He's already with you. He's the light that lights up your conscience from the time you're conceived. If you're seeking truth, you'll find him. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world didn't know him. He came to his own, his own did not receive him. The Jews as a whole rejected him. You know. But as many as he as did receive him, he gave them to the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of humans, not of uh, blood or the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, or became human, and lived well among us we beheld his glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth begotten does not mean created it means adopted after his death on the cross when he was separated from god god forsook him why did god do that because if he hadn't he would still be forsaking us his death on the cross turned things around for us philippians chapter 2, who being in the form of God, referring again to Christ, being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Where Jesus says, the Father and I are one, that word one, hes, H-E-I-S, literally means one substance, one essence. They're the same essence. And when the Jews heard him say it, they took up rocks to throw at him to kill him. Uh, and they, they said, why are you doing this? They said, because you're blaspheming. You're making yourself out to be God. Or some translations, equal to God. But there's only one God. See, they understood what he was saying perfectly, but they didn't know who he was. When you speak your word, your word goes forth. That substance, that essence of you speaking forth, that's you. That's you when you speak forth. My essence, my substance is going to you right now. You're hearing my word. Jesus is saying, it's the Father that sent me. I'm here to declare him. I'm his substance that he has sent to tell you about him. 
one God. You're in His image and likeness. There's only one of you, not three. You've got a spirit within you. The Bible calls it the spirit of a man. God's got a spirit in Him. It's called the Holy Spirit. In both instances, it's the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. You speak your word to declare yourself. God speaks His word to declare Himself. In uh, 400 A.D., the Roman Catholic Church came up with a doctrine of three divine persons who were separate and independent of each other. And Jesus, they said, was not the same substance, not the same substance as the Father. Well, that's blasphemy. That's polygamy. It's not polygamy is the wrong word. That's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Belief in more than one God. Technically, that's what it is. So everyone talks about the Trinity. Well, if you're in a image and likeness, I'll have to ask you this. Are there three of you? No? Then why do you say there are three of God? Why? That's not what God said. The greatest commandment, and God said this, is the greatest commandment that he ever gave to anyone ever throughout history. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And you shall love him, not them, him, with all your heart and soul and mind. And when the Pharisees said that to Jesus, Jesus said, yeah, that's right. And the Father and I are one. And that's when they took up stones to stone. They didn't understand that that's the word of God in the flesh standing in front of them. One essence with the Father that he came from his heart and anointed of his spirit out of his mouth. That's what's standing in front of you, speaking to you. But they didn't get it because they didn't belong to him. They were not sheep of his pasture. He accused them. He said, you're, uh, you're of your father, the devil, and you do his works. When these same group of guys went to, uh, some of them went to be baptized by John the Baptist, he said, you, you bunch of snakes, you vipers. That's a poisonous snake, a viper. Who has warned you of the wrath to come? Jesus said, you're like whitewashed gravestones on the outside. You look clean, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. He wasn't just saying it to insult them. He was telling them what, the way it was. Repent, get saved. Some of them got it. Some of them didn't get it. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took on himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a, uh, given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father God's going to put down this rebellion that's been going on now for about 6,000 years or maybe longer I don't know, something like that. he's going to bring it into it and he's the good God and holy and it's good that he brings it into it Romans 1, 2, which he had promised afore by the prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made the seed of David, according to the flesh, the, in the lineage, seed of King David, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name whose of the fathers and of whom are concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God blessed forever there's another scripture that declares him to be God it's, it's all through the scripture you have to work at it to miss it 1st Timothy 3.16 without controversy great is this mystery of godliness God manifested as a human, or in the flesh, as a human. He was justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached 
to the nations or Gentiles, believed on in the world and received up into glory. There's another scripture that declares Jesus to be God. Um, you know, now in Hebrews, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, becoming a human, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. In Scripture and Revelation it says they overcame that wicked one by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Well, that wicked one is referring to the devil. They overcame that wicked one by the blood of the Lamb, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us and grant us peace. You have heard that. And the word of their testimony. Jesus is declared to be the word. He is the word. That's what, that's what he is. And that took human form. So when we are overcoming Satan by the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony, what are we testifying about? We're testifying that we have overcome Satan by the blood of Jesus. That's what our testimony is about. And that word that's going forth from us is also Jesus. We're testifying by Jesus Christ in us that his blood avails for us and that's how we've overcome the devil. Jesus' blood, Jesus' flesh, Jesus' name, Jesus' anointing, Jesus' love. Christ in me, my hope of glory. I no longer live. I no longer love. I no longer work. It's Christ in me doing the work. It's Christ in me living and loving. It's his life in me. I don't exist anymore. I died. I'm dead. When you get that revelation in your spirit, when you get a hold of that, and it's no longer, and this is scripture, it's no longer I that live. It's Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live in this body is by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus took that old dead heart of Adam, that nature out of us, and put his, gave us a new heart that he could write his laws on that on our heart. How, how are those laws fulfilled? In his love. When you're walking in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not inclined to steal and kill and commit adultery and ad finitum. You're not inclined to do that. Why? Because it's Christ's nature in you. That's how he fulfilled the law. That's how come we're saved by faith in him aside from the observance of the law. In the Old Testament, you had to keep these laws. There was all these series of do this, don't do that. There's a long list of them. But Jesus said, he said really a couple of things that, that, that stand out. He said, even if you think about having sex with another man's wife, you've committed adultery. Just think about it and you've done it. That wasn't in the Old Testament. You had to commit the act, but Jesus, Jesus said, no. You think about it, you've, you've done it. It's counted to you as sin. In the Old Testament, if you murdered somebody, took their life unjustly, you were a murderer. But Jesus said, oh, I want to show you something here. If you hate someone in your heart without just cause, you're a murderer. You don't have to go out and kill them to be a murderer. You hate them in your heart. You're a murderer. And Jesus, after showing the, the disciples what's come to known as the Lord's Prayer, Part of that prayer says, forgive us our wrongs, our debts, our trespasses, as we forgive those who have wronged us. And after that prayer, you can read it there in your Bible, Jesus said this, after that prayer, he turns to the disciples and he says, if you don't forgive others their trespasses, my Father's not going to forgive you. Guess what happens if you die and that's still in you? You're not going to get into heaven. You're not getting into heaven. Well then, since the Bible says only God can forgive sin, 
And Jesus said, if you don't forgive others their sin, God won't forgive you. What are we supposed to do? Receive Christ. Christ is God, and He's in you. And so you come before Christ, put your hands right on your belly, because that's where God talks to you from. That's your midst, your center. Out of their belly flows rivers of living water. And let that living water, that's the, the voice of the Holy Spirit, because Christ said, I'll send you the Holy Spirit, and He'll communicate with you. He'll testify of me. Okay, by Christ in me, Christ, the anointed of the Holy Spirit, by Christ in me, Jesus said, you, you'll receive the Holy Spirit, and if, and if you keep my, my commands, my teachings, I'll come to be with you, and the Father will come uh, and be with you. So, there's the Godhead right there in your midst. If you're walking with God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are all right, right in your midst. So put your hand there, and because well, it helps you to focus on, on where you're listening from. Father, I forgive. Name who the person is. Do them one at a time, by the way. Doesn't matter how long the list is. Each time someone comes to mind, so to speak. I forgive so and so for what they, for how they have hurt me and I ask you Jesus Christ I'm asking you and, and the Father in Jesus name you forgive that person you do Jesus and in you in you since I'm of you and in you I in you forgive that person and you'll feel that wall lift don't let anything get in the way of your walk with God that peace should always be there it shouldn't be intermittent because we're always getting into something that blocks that that peace. And that peace will direct you. It'll tell you when you're going the wrong way. If you're listening from there, sometimes we just want something so bad we do it anyway. Well, it must be God. Look how much I want it. I know he told me to marry that girl. Wait a minute. Hang on. He's already married to somebody. Yeah, I know, but we love each other so much. You feel what happens down your gut when you say that? God's not giving you a thumbs up for it. He's saying, no, you're going the wrong way. You don't covet what doesn't belong to you. So when you learn to hear that voice, by the way, there's a teaching I've put it uh, at my website. Uh, if you go to uh, at my website, you go to Jesus... If you'll type my name into a Google search, you'll see it appear at the top of the list, Gary T. Sawyer. Click on the top link. There's more than one link for me there, but you click on the top one, it'll take you to my, my YouTube website. When you get there, click on the word video. And when you click on video, I've got like over 200 videos posted so far. And scroll down until you find the one called Witness. It's about an 18 minute video I put together. Right below that video, there's the description. It's called the description box. It's like a gray colored little uh, rectangle description box. And it's got a few words there. And then right below it, there it says open. I think the word is, yeah, open. If you'll click on that, you'll get a drop down. And it lists about five different links. One of those links you go to, it'll teach you how to hear the voice. How to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you like to know how to do that? listen to it. Go there and listen to it. Another link uh, talks about the, the Passover wounds of Jesus. You know, Jesus said that if you, if you wrongly discern the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ when you're taking it, the Bible says, for this reason many of you are sick and many others have fallen asleep before their time. They you die before your time. Because you're wrongly discerning. When you take that body and blood of of Christ, you better understand what you're doing or you can or it can kill you. You'll eat and drink damnation to yourself. That's a good study for you to go listen to. The same web link. There's a, there's a link there right below the, the witness uh, video. Another one talks about the nature of Christ. Another one talks about the uh, future events, eschatology, future events that are on the way, including World War III, which is going to happen before God takes the church out of the earth. How do I know that? It's very clearly written in the Bible. Listen to it. It's about a 
it's about a hundred page read hundred pages maybe a little, little over a hundred pages well worth reading typewritten pages you don't get to hear my voice on that well actually you can go to my website at, at YouTube but it's in 21 parts 24 24 yeah 24 I think 24 parts each parts about an hour <laughs> 24 hours of listening to my voice just go to the other link it it'll take you to a um, Google a Google cloud website and it's typewritten and you can just read it at your leisure it's something you should know because this war World War three is going to be nuclear it's going to wipe out the United States in fact, it's going to kill half the planet. It's going to kill about 4 billion people. How do I know that? The Bible says so. Where does it say that? Go read the link and have your Bible there. And you can open it up and you can compare it with what your Bible says. The only safe place is Jesus. And I believe the war is getting close. I do believe that. Maybe half a dozen or more years. Maybe 20. I don't know that it could be much more than that. But, you know, I don't have an exact day and hour. But Jesus did give a commandment that you, and it was when he spoke, he was speaking there in the imperative, which means I command you to know the season. I command you to know it. So let's study to show ourselves approved and not disappoint the Lord and not be caught off unawares. The last seven years, that's what it's called at that uh, link that you'll find below the witness channel. There's another link there. It tells you how to forgive others from the heart. Um, how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit uh, talks about the Passover wounds of Jesus uh, talks about the nature of Jesus we're covering a lot of that here in this video and it talks about uh, the last seven years it's an eschatological that's just a 95 cent word that means end times prophecy but it goes through the scriptures and what the prophets have to say and it, put, it puts things in order I strongly urge you to listen to those links. The Lord gave that to me. As surely as I'm talking to you, He gave that to me, and you need to hear it. Be prepared. Don't get cut off guard. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard and seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, the word of life. This is Christ manifest. He's referred to as the word of life, uh, the word of God. In fact, he's got a lot of names with the word word in it because that's who he is, the word. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and we bear witness, and we show you that eternal life, which was with the Father. He manifested to us. That word manifested as a human being, he manifested to us. That which we have seen and we have heard, we declare it to you. We saw him, we heard him, we, we touched him, we handled him. He's real. And we saw him die, we saw him come back from the dead. Some of the disciples scattered. If you look close in scripture, you'll find the reference where it says, they stood afar off and watched him cruci be crucified. They stood afar off. Well, some of them are right there. At the, John was right there at the, cross, the base of the cross. Mary was right there. But uh, the other folks, and that's the way it's worded, I believe, in the Bible, they stood afar off. Why? Because they didn't want to get uh, busted as being his followers and put to death. Peter denied him three times. I don't know who he is. I don't know the man. I don't know. Three times he denied him. Jesus told him he would, and he didn't believe it. And then he found out, oops, yeah, I did. Of course... God didn't say, well, I'm done with you. No, he said, i got work for you to do. I forgive you. Come on. He's very loving. 
course there does come a situation when a person sins so bad that their conscience is burnt or seared s-e-a-r-e-d as with it says in the bible is with a hot iron like when you're ironing you burn you burn your clothes seared is with a hot iron it's like when your, your flesh gets seared and when it gets to that point God can't reach you anymore he takes you out and you don't go to a nice place that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that we have fellowship that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son Jesus Christ the Son of God took upon uh, a complete human nature this human nature will exist forever thus the hypostatic union God and man now we look at a word called Iosos someone said oh that's Greek that those Greek mythologists that means Jesus Jesus no it doesn't you ignorant bless your pea picking heart individual it doesn't mean a Zeus it's Iosis Iosis Jesus and the English over the Greek is Jesus and the uh, English over the Hebrew Old Testament is Joshua okay Let's scroll down here and take a look those who mistakenly believe that Jesus is a pagan Greek word derived from Zeus let's take a look at this so we can put that garbage to bed and be done with it the New Testament was written in Konea which means common man Konea Greek it was the language of the day it was the language in the well, in the street the language in the university it was the language in the marketplace why Greek because there was a guy named Alexander who conquered the known civilized world and about 600 years earlier and since he was ruling the world he said everybody's going to speak Greek because I'm from Greece and God okayed that why would God okay that because he wanted the disciples to have a common language throughout the earth that he would be sending them so the disciples could communicate Christ to these different countries that's why that's also why God had the Romans build such great roads all roads lead to Rome? Yeah, there's still ro there are still Roman roads today that people use. No, no potholes. Now they were building roads 2,000 years ago that are better condition than ours are. Anyway, the Greek words for Zeus, Z-E-U-S, and Theos. Theos is a generic word, like we say the word God. We use the word God, and the Greeks would use the word Theos. And you get the word Theomatic, uh, which is like the study of the study of God, Theomatics. But anyway, those words come from the same Sanskrit word, which is a much older language than the Greek. Uh, but they became part of the Greek language. It's just like there's so many languages that became part of the English language incorporated. Theos is a generic Greek word, just like God is a generic word in the English language. However, the Greek word Iosis means Savior. That's what the word means. Point it up. You can look it up in uh, Young's Analytical Concordance, or Strong's, or Cruden's, or you can look it up in a uh, uh, Greek-English um, Bible. There's, there's a lot of places you can, a lot of references you can look it up from. But the Greek word Iosis means Savior, and it does not underline this. It does not come from the same Sanskrit word as does Zeus and Theos. It's a different word. Jesus is transliterated from the Greek Iosis, which is the closest Greek equivalent to the Hebrew name Yeshua. 
which transliterates the English over the Hebrew is Joshua. And it's found 216 times in the Old Testament, Yeshua or Joshua, the Anglicized uh, from the Hebrew into English. And it was the third most common Jewish name among Jews during the time of Jesus Christ. Just like uh, in my neck of the woods here in San Antonio, Texas, uh, it'd be an exaggeration if I said every other guy I met was named Jesus or Jesus. That's the way it's pronounced. Jesus. But a lot of people are. At this time, it was the third most common name 2,000 years ago among Jewish men. And uh, Miriam, which is transliterated into English, Mary. Miriam was the, the most common name among Jewish women for that day. Miriam. It's still used a lot. You don't meet very many Jews with the name Jesus anymore. But you'll meet a lot of people named Miriam. So Revelation 1.8, I am Alpha Omega. I begin and end all things, says the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come. I'm eternal. I'm almighty. The I am. The divine name of God. Moses said to God, God said, you go tell uh, Pharaoh, let my people go out of Egypt. And Moses said, who should I tell him has sent me? What is your name? And God says, you tell him I am has sent you. The divine name of God. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Who's saying this? Jesus. I am the gate. I am the gate of the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. That's making a correction there while I'm doing this. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way and the truth and the life. I'm the true vine. The Bible says Jesus is that true vine. The Father's the husbandman where the vine is growing. And Jesus is that vine, the true vine. And the Bible says that the, uh, the branches that are grafted into the vine, referring to the nations, because Israel was the original branch that God had planted, his original planting, and then we in Christ get planted and we're like adopted into it. The fruit hangs on the branch, but the branch doesn't produce it. It's just hanging off of it. Well, where does it get produced? Comes up from the from the vine, that spiritual sap or substance or essence or nature comes up through the vine out into the branches to produce the fruit. In other words, God's producing the works. If you're trying to produce your own works to please God, you're missing it. No one ever got into heaven that way. Nobody. You don't get there by doing good works. You need to have the God kind of faith, and that faith is faith in Jesus Christ and His shed blood. That's the God kind of faith. That's the faith that God has that He can get you into heaven. You need to line your faith up with what He has faith in. Do you follow? For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He himself is the propitiation for our sin. He took our sinfulness upon himself and then took on the 
penalty, the price, the payment of that sin upon himself. And he died physically and spiritually. That death was, that spiritual death was a separation from the Father. Someone said, God can't die. Yeah, he can, and he did. That death referred to, that spiritual death, is separation from the Father. He's his eternal word. Throughout eternity, he's been with the Father. Throughout all eternity. But he left eternity. He came down here into this space of, called Earth and time to go to the cross for us. When was he separated from the Father? On the cross. Where does it say that? In the Bible. Eloi, Eloi, lamana sabachthani, my mighty one, my mighty one, why have you forsaken me? The Father turned his back on him. The Lord gave me a vision. It was very brief. But it, it really shook me up. It was just a, a flash of his face on the cross. It was so twisted. It was so contorted. At first I thought I was looking at a demon. And then I realized, well, that, that's, that's Christ on the cross. And when you look in scripture, it says his face was marred more than any man's. Uh, his form beyond that of a man. He didn't even look like a human being from what he endured on that cross. Didn't even look human anymore. And I got a glimpse of that. And it shook me up. He himself is the propitiation of our sins, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. He even died for those who aren't going to be saved. Not that they couldn't be, but it says... A lot of people refuse to stay in their sin. They don't want to come into the light because they don't want the, the, that unruly nature. They, they bow to that unruly, they submit to that unruly nature instead of submitting themselves to Christ. People don't like submitting themselves to others. A lot of people, they have a boss, they don't want to submit to him. A lot of people aren't welcome in the military. I put in more than 20 years active duty, but a lot of people, the, the military is just not right for them. They don't want to submit to all these rules and regulations of the military. A lot of wives don't want to submit to their husbands. A lot of children don't want to submit to their parents. It's the Adamic nature in a person. You can only reproduce in your own image. And Adam's image was marred from his sin, his rebellion against God. And so we got that rebellious nature in him. <coughs> That's why Jesus said you have to be rebirth of a new nature <clears throat> from above of the spirit and the water. He's the, he's the water. The water of the word, the Bible says. He's the living water. Drink this water, you'll never thirst again. I'm the living water. That's the water, not your baptismal water. That baptismal water is just an outward representation of what you believe you have a clean conscience. Is that in scripture? Yes, it is. You read about that in Peter. Peter talks about that. You must be born again from above, Jesus said. Your church baptismal is not up in heaven, but Jesus is. And if you receive him into you, then he's with you also. You're in him there. He's in you here. You submit to him. He takes over. There's new management. He's running the place. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, he says, but you don't do what I tell you to do. You gave me lip service, but you don't do what I tell you to do. And at the last, what's he going to say to you if you're like that? I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. You never submitted to my lordship. I don't see my spiritual substance in you. I don't see you bowing to that and walking with me. God doesn't play games. What you sow is what you reap. Exactly. Don't play games with him. You'll wish you hadn't. The Bible says it's a terror to fall into the hands of the living God without a mediator. You better hope you have Christ as your mediator. 
Because when you stand before God, your own heart is going to judge you. You're not going to be able to throw up any flack. Your own heart is going to judge you. You're going to stand naked before the true, living, holy light. And your own heart is going to judge you in that light. And if your heart condemns you, you are going into hellfire. Now that is the truth. That's the truth. If your heart condemns you, you go to hell. You don't have to go there. But Jesus said most people wind up going there. He's here for what he calls the pearl of great price. Jesus bought this earth in his own blood. He purchased it and everything in it. Winning back everything that Adam had turned over to Satan, Jesus won it back. It says not only things in earth, but things in heaven. Everything's reconciled unto him. Doesn't mean everybody's going to get saved. It just means everything's reconciled unto him that created it all. You need to learn to submit yourself to God. If you've got a problem with that, then you tell you tell Jesus, Look, I want to submit to you. I need your help to do it. Please help me. I don't want to go to hell. That's an honest prayer, and he will honor it. If you mean it when you say it. But because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently the Old Testament, they didn't hold the priesthood permanently because they kept dying generation after generation. You know, the, the Levites and the Cohens and the Conanines and the, basically the Levitical priesthood, the Levites, the Aaronic priesthood, but the, they kept dying, but not Christ. Not Christ. This is an eternal priesthood. <coughs> Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede for them. He's up there now praying for you. Well, how can he do that? He's God. He can pray for everybody all at the same time. For this is the kind of high priest we need. He's holy. He's innocent. He's undefiled. Separated from sinners. He would break bread with them, but he didn't hang out with them to do anything wrong exalted above the heavens higher than the heavens when you read Ezekiel I believe it's chapter 1 Ezekiel has a vision he's caught up into heaven and he sees all these interesting creatures all over the place interesting creatures and then his gaze is directed above all of these heavenly creatures, above it, and he sees a man sitting on a throne. A man sitting on a throne above all these creatures. And if you take what Ezekiel said there in chapter 1 of Ezekiel, and you look at what John the Revelator said, the description of both of those men just about identical. Of what they both saw. Ezekiel was looking on a pre incarnate Christ. Pre incarnate, before he took human form. Jesus said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. If you receive me, accept me, you receive and accept the Father. If you reject me, you reject the Father. Why? Because I am his word. He saw Jesus sitting there. He saw the eternal word of God sitting there. Of course, there's a, a we can use the word, a screen, a door, whatever you want to call it. There's this, he couldn't, he, neither John nor, nor Ezekiel could look to the side of Jesus where the Father was. Why? Because they'd kill him. They couldn't stand it. Jesus is like, God could, the Father puts like a, like a rheostat there. You can turn the light up and you can turn it down in Jesus. But the Bible says the Father is revealed through the face of Jesus. 
even though Jesus is sitting at his right hand. He's the mediator between God and us. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day like they did in the Old Testament. The evening oblations, the burnt offerings, and the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One offering, one sacrifice forever. Not like the high priest always offering, giving offerings for sins, and sheep, and turtle doves, and bullocks, and et cetera, et cetera, for those people. No, he did it once and for all when he offered himself. And if you read Hebrews chapter 7 and 9, the book of Hebrews, it very clearly, read it slowly so you'll get it, says that nobody got saved through these sheep being sacrificed in the Old Testament, and turtle doves, and you know, etc. It didn't save anybody. These were types and shadows. But the archetype, Christ himself, it says, is the substance. These other things, Old Testament, were types and shadows, just like all these Old Testament feasts. And they were pointing to Christ, to the cross. Once and for all. I've got a hundred different directions I can take this right now, but I'm going to go to the next part of this. We're looking in the Bible. Was what it says? What does it say about Jesus Christ? 16, okay. It says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Well, your faith needs to be the guy kind of faith. And it's the faith that Jesus generates in you. He's the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith. One Lord. You know, I mean, there's the Father and there's the Son. But they're the same substance. God and His Word are the same essence. That's what Jesus was trying to explain to those people. They understood He was saying, yeah, I'm one essence with the Father. But they didn't understand that He is one essence with the Father because He's His eternal Word that the Father sent to declare himself. They didn't get it. And Jesus explains to them why you don't get it. He says, you're not chief of my, of my pasture. You don't belong to me. You serve the devil. Daniel 2.47, the Lord is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. Now let's look at the New Testament. That was Daniel. Now Revelation. Jesus is the Lamb uh, the Lamb is the Lord of Lords. God and His Word are one. About 175 of these are found when running references of Jesus and Lord. So I've listed a few of them here. When He said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, the, the thief on the cross to His right. And Jesus answered, Today you'll be with me in paradise. And they entered in and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. But one of the twelve named Thomas, the word means twin, Thomas, was not with them when Jesus appeared before them, came to them. So the other disciples kept telling him, you know, Thomas, hey, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, and again the word hand in the Greek includes the wrist as part of the hand. If I don't see those nails in his wrists, put my finger in the mark or the hole where that pike, that spear was shoved through his chest and burst his heart, unless I put my hand in there, into his side, I'll never believe. Doubting Thomas. After eight days, his disciples were indoors again, eight days later, and Thomas was with them that, on that occasion. And even though the doors were locked, why were the doors locked? Because those guys were shivering in their boots. They were afraid their Roman soldiers were going to come and drag them off and crucify them. 
insurrectionists. You were followers of Jesus. You must die. They kept the door locked. And Jesus came into the midst of them, even though the door was locked. You can do stuff like that. You can walk on water. He's God. And he said, peace to you. They're all bent out of shape. So Jesus says, peace to you. Peace. Peace. Then he said to Thomas, reach out your finger and behold my, my hands or my wrists. Again, that word translates wrist as part of the hand from the Koine Greek. And reach, reach here your hand and thrust it into my side. And don't be faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered, he said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those that have not seen and yet have believed. In the book of Revelation, there's a long laundry list of people that are going to be cast into the lake of fire. All those that take the mark of the beast, or the number of his name, they're going to the lake of fire. You know who else is listed there? All liars. Do you tell lies? Even little white lies? You're a liar. You better repent of it. Oh, surely God didn't mind me just telling these few little lies. Want to bet? Want to bet your soul on it? All liars go to the lake of fire. That's what's written. Read the book of Revelation. Let's wake up, people. Let's wake up. Time's getting short. Adulterers go to the lake of fire. Some of you need to repent of some things you've been sowing and turn away from it. It's not just enough to say, I repent and keep doing it. That's really not repentance. Godly repentance of something will induce a stoppage. The word repent means to turn around and go the other way. Maybe some of you need to uh, spend more time with the Lord to get past some of these besetting iniquities that you're performing. Maybe some of you need to get some deliverance from some demonic spirits. Oh, I'm a Christian. I can't have a, I cannot have a demonic spirit afflicting me. <laughs> want to bet? Do you want to bet? Even Paul suffered that. He talked about these. Uh, some translations say these fiery darts or these flaming arrows that Satan would shoot into his mind. Paul was afflicted by demonic spirits. What well, makes you think you're not going to be? Satan was always coming up to Jesus and tempting him, and Jesus would say, would rebuke him. How would he rebuke him? It is written. It is written. And when he told him, he said, get behind me, it literally translates, get behind me, Satan. Get out of my sight. He told him to get out of his sight. If you submit yourself to God, you can resist the devil and he'll flee. And it, it may be more than just a, a few minutes of, uh, of fighting. Sometimes it can turn into a real marathon. How focused are you? How bad do you want to get free? At the top of that list of people getting thrown into the lake of fire, the very first thing listed up there is if you are a coward. That took you, didn't it? No surprise. Really? Really? All cowards go to the lake of fire. Now you know what God thinks about cowards. But you trust in Jesus. He'll deliver you from fear. He'll deliver you from cowardice. Wherefore, wherefore uh, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus, again the word Lord, went in and out among us, this is the stone which was set at naught for you builders, 
the stone to build the temple that you said it not meaning the builders of it they rejected you which has become the head of the corner now neither is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven no other name not Mary Joseph Michael Martha not Vishnu not Krishna not Buddha not Mohammed there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved God brings you to him by God that was God that hung on the cross and that's God that if you put your faith in what he's done for you his work submit yourself to him he'll save you if you try to earn it by doing good works you won't make it if you say well you know I'm I'm gonna be uh, when I die I'm gonna be like a God there's more than one religion that looks at it like that and uh, my wife's gonna have like a thousand spiritual children and they're all gonna be gods I don't have to name that if you know what I'm talking about I won't go there but yeah that's what they believe but we look in Isaiah God says I don't know if any other God but me I'm the only one there isn't any other so how about all you people are saying well we're all gonna be gods newsflash spoiler alert go back to Genesis the beginning the bare sheet the beginning Genesis what does it say Satan tempted them to be gods like God you can be like him Satan said to Eve and that's why he does not want you to eat of it because you'd be like him how stupid can you get but she ate it anyway she saw it was then she saw oh this is good I can be like him you don't get to be more like God by disobeying him and he said who are you Lord and the Lord said I am Jesus that you persecute this was Saul on the road to Damascus is it hard for you to kick against the prods the pricks I keep pricking you prodding you you're not listening to me so now I've knocked you off your high horse and I've blinded you now you're gonna listen to me well getting poked with a sharp stick being beats dying and going to hell anyway let's continue here and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said brother Saul the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto me in the way that you came has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians that they went about to slay him again you see the word Lord keeps appearing Jesus is Lord and the word which God sent to the children of Israel preached the peace by Jesus Christ he is Lord of all for as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ which was I that I what was I that I could withstand God this is a reference to uh, some of the Jews who were saying what are you, why are you preaching to the Gentiles you know this is uh, this is our thing and they got informed no, no God died for all of us not just the Jew some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene which when they were come to Antioch spoken to the Grecians preaching the Lord Jesus but we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they someone said well I, I confess Jesus is the Christ and he's my Savior you're leaving a word out there it's spelled L O R D Do you confess him as your Lord and Savior how can he be your Savior if he's not your Lord 
In fact, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I tell you to do? Take up your cross and follow him. That means suffer the crucifixion, the death of your self. That's what it's about. You want real salvation? That's what it's really about. Death of self. Make Jesus the real Lord over you. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And this continued by the space of two years, that when they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. They didn't really know Jesus, not this group of guys, these uh, vagabond gypsy Jews. They were uh, they said they were exorcists, but they didn't know Jesus. Well, what happened to them? <laughs> Well, the man with the evil spirits tore off all their clothes so they were naked and threw them out of the house. If you're going to cast out devils in the name of Jesus, you had better know Jesus. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. But none of these things move me, neither count I life dear to me, unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I have shown you these things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give, than to receive. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem. Uh, he was heading off to Jerusalem. Some of the other uh, believers, one of them said, he, he bound his hands with a cord to represent something. He said, uh, But if, if you go there, it's going to be going to be like that. They're going to bind you. And Paul said, I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. He which testifies of these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Additional scriptures from Zechariah and Revelation to Jude. It shall come to pass in that day that I, God Almighty, will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. You know, there's another passage in the Bible where God says, I'm going to destroy all the nations where the Jews have been scattered. Did you know there's more Jews in this country than there are in Israel, in the United States? When God says he's going to destroy all the nations where the Jews have been scattered, all means all. World War III is not far off. The only safe place you can be is in Christ Jesus. I'll pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants, by the way, uh, the teaching about World War III and other events surrounding that. The study of eschatology is the study of, of the uh, end times prophecies. It's called the last seven years. <clears throat> it's worth your time to read it. Storing up uh, half a dozen cans of tuna fish in your cupboard in case it all hits. Yeah, how long is that going to last? It's going to be nuclear. It's going to kill half the people on the planet. About four billion people. You better be ready for it. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. They'll look upon me, not a mighty whom they have pierced. 
when Jesus comes back, the Jews are going to look on him because they've heard about Jesus, about how he was crucified by the Jews. And they shall grieve, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. He came to us 2,000 years ago and we're just woken up to it and they'll grieve over what they've done. And they shall be bitterness for him, in bitterness for him, as one is in bitterness for his firstborn son. Another passage where it says that uh, they asked him, where did you get those wounds between your hands and in your side? And he'll answer, these are the wounds whereby I was wounded in the house of my loving friends. That's the way he'll answer them. Is that in your Bible? Yes, it is. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, you shall flee, like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come with all the saints with you. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, there were two Enochs. Uh, one of the Enochs was the the son of Cain, the first murderer. But this Enoch refers to here is, is not that Enoch. This Enoch, it was in seventh generation from Adam. Different, different soul, different man. But he prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Now that's in the book of Jude. Prophesied. And the same prophecy come with all the saints in the book of Zechariah. 1 Thessalonians, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. In the Old Testament it is God who is coming, in the New Testament it's the Lord Jesus Christ who is coming. It doesn't take very much to figure out God and the Lord Jesus Christ are the same substance. He's his word. I hope your heart's ready for him. I can tell you by my understanding of scripture and I believe it's right on the line because I started studying this intensely back in the latter part of 1973 the teaching called uh, the last seven years this eschatological study about what the Bible says is the end of the world is the world going to end yes it is what's going to happen to me when it ends Depends. Do you know Jesus? Well, that's about an hour, and so that concludes the uh, the teaching of part nine, which began with the hypostatic union. Part ten will be uh, the tetragrammaton. This is a very interesting study, but I'm going to conclude uh, part nine here. I'll ask the Lord to bless you and see you on the flip side. Amen.